Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we've been talking about the Cures Act. It has a lot of bipartisan provisions that I'm really glad became law. Uh, during our recent hearing on gene editing, we discussed uh, new genetic privacy protections for research participants that Senator Enzi and I had worked on together. Uh, right now, Massachusetts biotech companies are benefiting from a provision that Senator Bennett and Senator Burr and Senator Hatch and I wrote to try to clarify the FDA's authority relating to gene therapies for rare diseases. And I could go on. It's a, it's a long list. But cures also fell short in a really big way, and that's on funding. I led Democrats on this committee in calling for an extra $50 billion for the NIH and the FDA, and CURES did not send one single new dollar to these agencies. Instead, it only said that future Congresses might spend about 10% of that amount on NIH and FDA. And I'm glad that so far Congress has been increasing NIH funding, but I don't think it's time for us to pat ourselves on the back yet over where we are in funding the NIH. So, Dr. Collins, let me just go through this a little bit. Does the NIH fund most of the grant applications that it receives from scientists? Uh, no, we certainly aren't able to do that. We fund about 19% of those because that's the way it comes out after we do the priority scoring and see how much money we have. Okay, so out of every 100 applications you get, you're funding about 19 of them. Now, is that because the other 81 would have been bad investments that would not have helped us make biomedical breakthroughs to advance science? If we look back in history, say back around 2000, 2001, we were funding about 30 percent, maybe even 35 percent because the funds were more available. We've looked at those to see, did a grant that scored at the 25th percentile actually turn out to be less productive than one at the 15th percentile? The answer is no. We can't really tell the difference up to about the 30th percentile. Even though peer review is trying to draw distinctions, it's very hard to do so in that top third. So in other words, if we roughly, just using the numbers you had here, if we doubled, for example, the number of grants that we were able to fund, you think there's still a lot of good science to be had out I there? I think there'd be fantastic science. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's powerfully important. I want to follow up, too, on the point that Senator Baldwin made and, and the discussion you all had about uh, researchers in the early part of their career. You know, getting that first NIH grant can make or break an academic career. It can be the difference between whether the scientist stays in the fight or whether the scientist has to leave academic medicine and go somewhere else. So I just want to ask more about the details here. Where are we right now on early career researchers? What percentage of the grants are they able to get? So beginning in 2008, we actually instituted a policy so that those applicants who came to us for the first time as a principal investigator got a bit of a boost. They competed against each other, essentially, as opposed to against the most experienced ones, which meant effectively in priority score terms they got a few extra points. Mm -hmm. But that's not good enough. We are still losing lots of those. Their success rates for those early stage investigators were still well below what you'd want to see. Ultimately, we think it would be most healthy if at least, say, 25% of those applications uh, were going to get funded. And, and that's what we're trying to do with this new initiative, the right. Next Generation Research Initiative, which is named specifically for the words that were used in the bill. Uh, thank you, Senator Baldwin, for that <laughs> encouragement. Uh -huh. But I understand right now, we've, we've been at about 16%, is that right? And you're saying, at a minimum, we ought to be boosting that to about 25%. And we've looked closely at every institute's successes and tried to figure out how we can get there with this new policy, yes. Oh, well, I know that NIH has done what it can in this area, but NIH funding is still down about 15% of where it was a decade ago, back when we had a 50% higher success rate for the proposals that were coming across reviewers' desks. The Cures Act did not solve this problem. Frankly, it didn't even come close. And that's why today we're reintroducing the National Biomedical Research Act, which provides $50 billion in new funding for the NIH and for the FDA. I see you're sitting up straighter there, uh, Dr. Gottlieb. Uh, this legislation is co-sponsored by Senator Sanders, Casey, Franken, Bennett, White House, Baldwin, Murphy, Kane, and Hassan, all the members of this committee, as well as several of our Democratic 
colleagues uh, who are not on the committee. Families across this country are waiting for medical breakthroughs, and researchers are waiting for the money to fund their work so they can make those breakthroughs. It's time for us to step up and put more money into NIH. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.